This is Taiwan Bound, the English language podcast of Tel Aviv University. Please welcome your host, Ido Aroni, Tel Aviv University's graduate, member of the Board of Governors, lecturer, writer, and veteran diplomat. Welcome to yet another episode of Tao Unbound. I'm Ido Aharoni, your host, and today I have the distinct pleasure of hosting someone very, very special with a very unique background, Professor Meir Ariel. Happy to be here. Thank you for being here, and let me, for, the, for our audience, to uh, read your title from my iPhone so I don't make a mistake because you have a very long title. My mother very, is listening. So. And very impressive. So Professor Meir Ariel is the head of the Tel Aviv University New Space Center. We'll talk about the difference between new space and old space. And you're also the director general of the Herzliya Science Center where you also served as an educator for many, year, many years. And he is a researcher at the School of uh, Electrical Engineering. Welcome to our podcast again. Thank you. Thank you. It's such a pleasure uh, seeing you again. We, uh, we met before when uh, we held this famous panel when the university sent its first nano satellite to yeah, space. It was two years ago. Since then, we launched another two. Another two. So, see, uh, we're making progress. But it was, uh, it was really inspiring to listen to your words then, two years ago. And uh, those listeners who were interested in that event, they can go online and search YouTube under Tel Aviv University nanospace and nanosatellite uh, launch to space and they'll see that panel which I think was an hour-long discussion where you spoke brilliantly about your work but before we jump into your scientific work tell us a little bit about your background I know you were born in give a time you were raised in Tel Aviv you are a product of Tel Aviv University all your degrees uh, tell us a little bit more about Well, I, I was born and raised in, in Israel in Giva time, which was back then in the 60s and 70s a, a middle class city. I think to some extent it still is, uh, even today. Um, my parents were both immigrants, like most of Israelis in the 1950s. Uh, they both came to Israel as teenagers. From where? From Baghdad. From both, Baghdad. Both of them. Uh, my family is from uh, Turkish origin, so both grandfathers... Uh, moved along the, the river uh, Euphrates to Baghdad, but uh, still uh, uh, they came as teenagers, so they didn't have uh, the opportunity uh, to go through the Israeli education system. My father uh, stayed in an Israel school, high school for only one year before being drafted to the IDF. And my mother had a chance to, to study only for two years in high school. And then... Uh, They, they had to, to provide for their families, so they have, had, had no access to, to higher education. Now, your last name, Ariel, was it something different before? Well, I was born by this name, Ariel, but the original family name is Turkish, is Aslan. Aslan means uh, lion in Turkish, so if you need to choose a family name, why not choose lion? That's, that's a very good name. So Ariel is, is more or less a translation. By the way, there's... Uh, <laughs> Uh, there's another common name uh, among uh, the Turkish Jewish community last name Namir namer yeah. uh, which also means I uh, think uh, that lion is better than the <laughs> tiger yeah. <laughs> yeah so so this this was it I mean uh, they, they have hey, had they knew nothing about higher education but but being both very talented people and people Both were good with numbers and in, in, in math, math, mathematics that they chose a profession, a free profession of accounting. Uh, my father uh, worked for the IRS for several years and then maybe it, uh, he was very successful. Then he, he became an independent tax consultant and my mother worked with him. So, so and I think that it's a, it's a quite um, um, common story of, of Jews that came from Iraq. And they were always very good uh, in accounting and, and business management. They did extremely well in the areas of accounting and law. Yeah. And, uh, and you see very prominent uh, CPAs in Israel of Iraqi background until this very day. Yeah. yeah people uh, tell me, you know, your, your father is an Iraqi that worked for the IRS. Oh, that's a common story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you and then when you were 16, the family moved to Tel Aviv. Yeah, I moved to Tel Aviv, but, but I, I, I uh, stayed at the same school and give a time. My, my father used to take me every morning, every morning to, to give a time. So it made perfect sense to him and to me. Uh, that's not uh, 
too obvious, I think. But uh, they, they were both, uh, my mother is still alive. Uh, they are both, were both uh, very creative people, very modest, very industrious entrepreneurs. Uh, my father had a notebook where he, he would write all his uh, ventures and he was always thinking of new business ventures and building ventures and at a later age he even st studied to play uh, the guitar and oud and organ and he was a songwriter and a singer and so uh, and so you eventually I learned something from them. Yeah. So, so you're <laughs> Uh, entrepreneurial spirit came from the parents I think so I think so although uh, I think that when, when I was a child I, I was quite reserved and maybe a bit ashamed of their mentality but but uh, when I was in high school I I, I now learned to, to appreciate when, them when did you discover your attraction to electrical engineering to uh, uh, electronics and uh, well I um, Basically, when, when I was young, I was fascinated by the, the stories of the Bible and by archaeology, and I, I was sure I'm going to be an archaeologist. But later, maybe in the 11th or, or 12th grade, it, it was already clear to me that I'm going to study either mathematics or physics. That was it. Uh, I was very good at, at math at school. Uh, again, although I did not have an example at home, maybe a, a funny story uh, Uh, when I was in the sixth grade, um, uh, my teacher, she, she provided me with a letter to Tel Aviv University. Um, I opened the letter and read it. Uh, and it was uh, for a, a professor at Tel Aviv University. He was engaged in research on gifted kids. And it, it, she said in this language, I'm sending you my best uh, pupil. He... He, he solves mathematical question in a very strange and creative way. Take care of him. So I gave the letter to my father, and then we went to Tel Aviv University. I think Eric Alando was involved in that, that it was the, the early stages of, of the, the, it, her uh, gifted activity. And we knocked on a door, and uh, someone opened the door, and he read the letter, and he said, You came in the wrong way. Come another day. And that was it. I mean, we never came back. And what, that was the end of my gifted uh, career. Uh, it ended on the same and, day. <laughs> and that was... Then, <laughs> was that a, a, um, a program, and like an official program that you so. were... I think so. Well, to? it was a uh, long, long time ago, probably. But, but uh, then later, when I was in the 11th grade... Uh, I, uh, it was clear to me that uh, I am going to concentrate in, in, in maybe physics or mathematics. But then when, when I was released from the, the, the military service, I had a friend who was uh, in a today, uh, a student, uh, a student soldier. He was studying electrical engineering. So I, I thought, well, maybe that's a good idea. Now, was there a, um, anything in your military service that... Uh, That helped you with your academic career? Well, not so uh, no, not whatsoever. I mean, I, I spent five years in the army in a combat unit. I was a company commander. So uh, nothing uh, so there was nothing uh, scientific about that. No, 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 <laughs> nothing scientific about that. I, I even remember that I studied for the psychometric exam. in Lebanon, deep, deep, deep underground in a bunker, and uh, that was it. Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> and uh, for our listeners and our viewers, I would say that um, um, the, Professor Ariel is talking about the Israeli uh, equivalent of what you would call the SATs uh, in America, and uh, so it's, exactly. a, it's a screening device that universities are using. And uh, it's not so easy to prepare uh, to such a, uh, an important exam when you're deep in a bunker in Lebanon. So that, that's, uh, that's, um, that's incredible you but did that. Ev eventually, I found myself in electrical engineering. But, but uh, later, uh, I, I realized that I'm not that related to technology. And in, in my uh, MSc and PhD degree, I concentrated more on on mathematics in the framework of, of electrical engineering. Now, I don't think that we, um, we don't have the time to learn more about in depth about your PhD, but, um, but you at heart, you are an educator. And you told me before we started the podcast 
that you had a terrific experience uh, serving as a principal of a high school, which is Thank a special you. high school in Israel, that is uh, training people to become scientists. Can you tell us about that chapter in your life? Well, it's a long chapter <laughs> that lasted for 10 years. Uh, after a career in the industry, um, I, actually, I believe that there is a large degree of randomness in the choices that we make. Uh, my wife found an ad in the newspaper and she asked me, wasn't it your dream to, to become a, a high school principal? I said, well, if you say so, I don't remember that. But anyway, I applied for the... You said, now it's my dream. <laughs> yeah. now, now it became my dream. <laughs> yeah. Uh, she would say anything to, uh, to, to help me, uh, I mean, leave uh, home and, 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 and go to work again. But anyway, uh, I applied for the job and I became, uh, became uh, an educator and uh, uh, I, I have five kids, and all of them are cynical. Uh, so uh, my daughter asked me, Dad, how did you find yourself in education? I mean, you hate kids. <laughs> <laughs> but I said, but these are not my kids. I don't care. <laughs> so, but anyway, uh, of course, I, uh, uh, it was a hidden passion of, of mine. And uh, I enjoyed very, very, very much this job, much more than working uh, uh, for the industry. And uh, and, uh, and I know that under your guidance, that school um, achieved great accomplishments. This is also, I think, by chance. Uh, uh, when I started um, my position there, there was uh, already uh, a space program there, which was not progressing too fast, so I took the challenge, and uh, we decided to build and launch the first miniature satellite of Israel. It was also the first satellite in the world to be built by high school st uh, students. Now, what year was that? It was in uh, 2014. We launched the satellite, and it operated flawlessly for five years. Incredible. And and, and that was an amazing uh, evidence of, of the of the capacity and even workmanship of kids when given an exciting challenge. So I'm an, an engineer, so being an engineer, I'm skeptical. So I wouldn't have thought of this idea myself. You know, you know skeptic people lose their hair. I see that you suffer from the same problem. Uh, yeah. But but anyway, uh, for kids, that's different. I mean, if you enter the class and say, uh, look, it's, today we're going to uh, build a satellite and launch it into space. And this sounds perfectly reasonable to them. And, uh, well, it, it, it was easier said than done. But again, we succeeded. And then... Uh, and now, uh, ba actually, ba based on that tremendous success, uh, you connected with Tel Aviv University and you started developing um, even a more ambitious program here. But before we go into that... Tell us a little bit, again, assuming that not every person who's listening to us right now is familiar with satellites. Why are they important? Where are they? Who's making them? How many out there? Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit more. Give us like a brief overview of satellites today. Okay. Uh, well, uh, space is involved in, each, in every aspect of, of our lives. GPS, for example. If you lose your phone, you're hopeless and helpless. Uh, communication, most of communication goes through space, uh, all kinds of, of, of course, security applications, science applications. Although the space race started as a mean to achieve national security goals as part of the Cold War, it's, it's not, it was not to, to uh, accomplish uh, or to look into the depth of, of the, the universe but rather as part of the Cold War between the Soviet yeah. Union so and the and they, they were United less, States. They were less concerned with <laughs> science and the betterment of humanity, more of concerned with politics. Yeah, of course. But, but still, uh, space became a platform for advancement in, in science and technology in a variety of areas. So, uh, for example, today, I mean, uh, most of the, the intercontinental communications goes through space, uh, there are many, many, many applications, including environmental. You can use satellites, for example, to observe 
uh, the to observe Earth and and uh, use uh, those observations for agriculture, for example, or to detect uh, pollution in the atmosphere or on the ground. Or so, even animal migration. And of course, anim- uh, there is a researcher at Tel Aviv University, uh, Professor Sivan Toledo, is engaged in, in, in researching animal migration by using Now, satellite. How, so, uh, technically, um, how big does a satellite have to be? Well, because uh, we think of a satellite, you know, as something huge. Well, uh, but... What your, your expertise is actually nanosatellites, very small satellites. Right. Uh, so tell uh, us about the difference between the two. Okay. Uh, for many years, uh, the, this uh, uh, field was dominated by governments and, and by defense bodies. And the satellites were big. Satellites that are used for, uh, for uh, espionage, for uh, communication. But... Uh, over the past maybe 10 years, there is... Uh, 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 well, the, the whole, the whole uh, domain is going, undergoing a process of privatization, which is motivated purely by scientific or commercial uh, motivation, as opposed to strategic or defense motivation. And if money means everything, then there is, uh, of course, a tendency to, uh, to make the satellite smaller, because smaller is cheaper. And, and, and this trend of nanosatellite, which started as a, a platform for training engineering students to build uh, uh, space systems, now is, is, uh, is becoming a, what is referred to as disruptive innovation. So if you can achieve the same scientific or commercial goal with a small satellite rather than a large satellite, then the big satellite industry is doomed. And, and those uh, companies, they have to reinvent themselves. So we are concentrating in building small satellites. Now, That's the difference. Now, beyond training purposes, what is the main purpose of small satellites? Is it, would you say, is mostly research? Well, uh, n- not just research, but also commercial. I, I mean, uh, if you can put uh, uh, a transceiver, uh, I mean, uh, communication equipment on a satellite, you can use small satellite for uh, communication. You, if you can put a camera, a small camera on a satellite, a small satellite, you can use the satellite for Earth observation. Of course, you can use the satellite for conducting all kinds of, of experiments. For example, in Tel Aviv University, we've built satellites for uh, monitoring cosmic radiation. And we, we were able to achieve the same scientific goal that can be achieved with, with big satellites. So, For uh, a fraction of the cost. That's the Now, idea. Would you say that's the main reason why we're experiencing, you know, for, for lack of a better word, I would use the word revolution uh, in terms of the number of satellites launched to space these days? We're talking about tens of thousands of them. Exactly. Most of the satellites being launched today are part of, of mega constellations. And... and uh, This is mainly to, due to the fact that it is now possible to use small satellite, rather small satellite, uh, launch into low Earth orbit uh, uh, to form a global uh, communication network. Uh, what was until maybe uh, three or four years, uh, most of the intercontinental communication w- was done uh, through what is referred to as geostationary satellite. Those are giants of five or six tons launched to a geostationary orbit that is 36,000 kilometers above Earth. That's the highest possible. That's the, it, well, uh, the highest possible is, is uh, infinity, but, but still... No, but I mean, in terms of te- technology. In terms of practical, in, in terms of, of uh, practical uses, if you send a satellite to 36,000 kilometers... Uh, the revolution of the satellite around Earth is synchronized with the revolution of Earth around its, its own axis. So and, let's and this, say a four or five satellites of that caliber would cover Earth, right? Exactly. Even three can cover Earth. Instead of this, you can send tens of thousands of satellites to low Earth orbit. That is about five or six hundred kilometers. And, and when you, you look at the sky, you will find... 
a satellite above your head. And those satellites can function as, as a cellular uh, system, like base stations of, uh, of an Earth cellular system. And, and, and this is really the future of the industry. This is the future of the industry, and most of the money goes to communication. So the, the, this uh, uh, industry is about four, maybe 450 billion dollars a year, and most of the money is devoted to building communication satellites. And of course, GPS satellites, which is s- somewhere in the middle between the low and the high uh, orbits, somewhere in the middle, about 20,000 kilometers. Now, when I, when I uh, met with you the first time two years ago, I was so impressed with the eclectic nature of your program here. At Tel Aviv University and you had students from all over the world and they were so excited they were so passionate now you you're telling us that since then you launched two more nano satellites tell us about the program today what's happening there about where the students are coming from and what are the plans of the future okay uh, uh, so far we have launched 14 nano satellites and all the missions have been successful so far uh, and for all the kinds of, of scientific missions as I said monitoring radiation or uh, for uh, for example for optical communication uh, for testing uh, uh, new technologies in space and so forth uh, the, the what's what's cool about uh, new space is that it is multidisciplinary combining the A large number of scientific disciplines which are not necessarily connected uh, and so um, the 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 number uh, of, of disciplines allow each and every student to choose a topic close to his or her heart and carry out research work in that area and 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 also so the the, the team that built the satellite is composed well of course mainly from engineering students but electrical engineers me- mechanical engineers uh, students who, t- who study uh, physics or computer science because the Well, uh, the, the 90% of the satellite is software still. Uh, and, and, and of course, there's the user's part. I mean, those researchers who use the, the, the satellite as a platform for conducting research. They are, not, they are not involved in building the satellite itself, but using it for their uh, uh, science uh, research. For example, uh, we have uh, a climate change uh, center here at Tel Aviv University, and we intend to build what is called uh, a multi-spectral satellite, a satellite that can take pictures in various uh, wavelengths of the Earth. And, and this uh, data can be used for analyzing climate change, for detecting uh, disasters, and uh, for agriculture, for example, for detecting pollutions in sea and in atmosphere and so forth. Now, in terms of your collaboration with other countries, other universities, um, if you can share some of that, some of that information, Well, uh, uh, of course, uh, Tel Aviv University is, is considered uh, to be a leader in, in new space. So we have uh, collaborations with many countries, uh, with Germany, with the United Kingdom, with, with of course, the uh, United States. Uh, I've been three times to India. The Indians are very much cooperative and, and want to learn from us and all kinds of exotic places like Korea, Azerbaijan, and so forth. Uh, I think that we have... special expertise in building miniature uh, space systems and of course we have a good track record and this is why I mean India is uh, is a giant in space but still uh, they they can learn from us how to succeed in such a, a small scale uh, project now would you say that that Israel and and uh, in particular your program at Tel Aviv University would you say that we are, punching above our weight or there's more to be desired where, where would you put us in terms of you know when you compare us to the rest of the world well uh, first of all I think that uh, uh, that we move very quickly I mean uh, launching so many nano satellites in such a short period of time I mean less than 10 years is something that is is quite remarkable and I The idea is that uh, you can learn not only from the experience of others but from your own experience there is something called referred to in, in the in the in academia or in industries 
as space heritage. That is the number of hours your uh, space system accumulated in space. And if you start a project and complete it and launch the satellite in less than two years, then you can start another one. And we are progressing in baby steps. So now we are accumulating and building. It's like a credit score in America, right? We're building our, our space heritage. This is and, what we're doing. And, and uh, you know, I can, I can uh, spend a lot more time discussing this with you, but unfortunately our time is running out. Um, I just wanted to end this with a question about the future. Um, if you can share with us your goals for the future, where would you like to see your program in the future and how we as a community can be of help to you? Well, uh, I think that uh, still the, the main challenge of the, the, the 21st century, maybe for the next 20 or 30 years before computers will replace us, the AI and everything, but is, is still a human challenge. I mean, the, the ability of people or researchers from different disciplines to communicate between them and to communicate information, to work to, together. So the, the multi-teamwork is, is the, the biggest challenge still. Uh, and, uh, and which is also your definition of new space. New space exactly. is about collaboration. It's about interdisciplinary exactly. approach. Exactly. Yeah, t- taking all those specialists and, and, and uh, let them work together to achieve a mutual goal. And so this is exactly what you, we are trying to do. And we have many, many uh, um, scientific goals. For example, uh, I heard that you interviewed uh, Professor Yaron Oz, the, the former rector, who is engaged in, in quantum research. So quantum communication is also part of, of our uh, program. We want to build the first uh, miniature quantum satellite. Uh, another uh, program, as I said, is in, in uh, multispectral uh, technology for uh, the benefit of, of humanity. Now, uh, if you can just, again, just in case there's someone out there who's interested in helping you, tell us a little bit more about the quantum satellite. Well, first of all, it costs about $20 million. Okay, that's 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 not not an issue. <laughs> <laughs> and in and, and the the idea is uh, to build a, a small platform, a miniature platform that can deliver quantum uh, encryption keys from space to targets on Earth, and this will enable uh, the enable the two parties to communicate securely between them. Be, 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 one word about uh, the, the quantum uh, revolution. Uh, uh, one, of the, one of the things that will happen in, in a post-quantum uh, era when quantum computers will, will become available or operational is that they will be able to crack all the, uh, all the uh, encryption that is done today. And because so, they'll have so much calculation power exactly. that we can't even begin to imagine right now. Right. And, and the solution lies also in quantum mechanics, using another encryption method that is based on the principles of quantum mechanics rather than uh, classical... Uh, well, I promise you that when that happens, uh, we're going to have you on another episode of Tau Unbound. Thank you for really intriguing interview it was a fascinating interview, and uh, thank you for everything that you do for the university and for science in general. Thank you. Thank you. It was and a pleasure. Uh, and to our listeners and viewers uh, back home, goodbye until our next episode from Tel Aviv. Bye-bye. This is Taiwan Bound, the English language podcast of Tel Aviv University. Please welcome your host, Ido Aroni, Tel Aviv University's graduate, member of the Board of Governors, lecturer, writer, and veteran diplomats.